Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Jason Dennett, Sales Director for Pixel Media. Um, what we're going to do for the next sort of 45 minutes or so, um, hot sunny day, inside talking about storage, so we'll try and be reasonably concise. Um, we're going to talk about um, really the sort of the storage environment, that the storage landscape, uh, in particular sort of the accepted practices at the moment, sort of customer habits and the way that technology is deployed, um, particularly with a view to the sort of how you might invest in the future, how you might get a bit more for your money by using some, thinking a little bit differently about the way that you deploy storage. Um, and we're going to sort of bolt that on to some of the things that we're doing out there with customers. So we're primarily really going to talk about three things. Um, we are, as I say, going to set up that sort of storage landscape. We'll kind of, we will describe that in accordance with PicStore, which is a platform that we deploy for uh, media customers. PixCash, which uh, my colleague Barry, Barry Evans is our technical director, he's going to take you through that. So PixCash is a particular element or feature set within what we do that is, is all towards global collaboration between sort of multiple sites and things. And then we've got Richard from, from Mellanox uh, with us. Mellanox are a technology partner of ours, and in particular they um, they work on sort of supercharging us in the internet, internet, uh, internet layer, so the, the network element of what we do in fact. So quite an important part of, of, our, of our story really. Um, so really, that's, those are the three areas we're going to run through um, over the next sort of half hour or so. So who are, who are we? Who are Pixel Media? I think you know, if we're going to sort of stand up here and tell you how it is with storage and what the future looks like, we should explain why, why, we, why our opinion is valid and why it should. So we are not a storage and network hardware vendor. I'd sort of argue quite passionately that we're not a storage vendor in that sense. We're a, we're a sort of a solutions vendor. We're a storage and network solutions vendor. If, if I had to encapsulate um, what we do into a single sort of pithy phrase, I would say that we, we build solutions to fit people's workflows and not, you know, we don't sell or deploy products that you then have to tailor your workflow to. And I think in terms of what I mean by that, that'll become a bit clearer in, in, as I run through the platform and, and some of the ideas that, we, that we're going to share with you. Specific to the media industry, we are a, a media specific company. We're not, you know, a storage vendor that's been selling sort of storage or network, network attached storage appliances in HPC or in oil and gas and you know like the look of media because it's groovy and I've come into it that way. We actually designed and, and, and you know we came into being in order to sell to the media market. And most of the technology that we deploy has its origins as a practice and a, and a method in the in the sort of media and media area. I've driven two people out already that's not good that's not a good sign. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. in, um, so, and then that kind of the, sort of the final point, again, I'll probably return to this a few times, is, um, is that we, we aggregate file system and storage network resources into a, a single global addressable entity. So, again, in keeping with this idea that we're not a you know, classic storage vendor, box shipping storage vendor, um, that is sort of another example of, of how we differ. Um, okay? So, we've been around since 2010. I think we've probably been aggressively trading for actually the last two years after a gentle start. Privately owned, so we are, you know, hopefully here to stay. We've um, we're sort of split across two locations. We have a, a sales and um, a commercial office in, in the London area, and we have our technical team all based at Sheffield, which is where Barry and his team spend all their time testing and pre-building and supporting things. Um, probably the chief piece here is just you know 50 pixel-based solutions. So there's 50 customer sites that are bound throughout media, which you know, and they cover a range of customers from visual effects for film commercials to sort of broadcast editorial environments and broadcast and services and sort of content delivery customers. So pretty much most aspects of media that you would you know, expect to find. We support our, custom, uh, our customers sort of globally and, um, and around the clock. So we have customers in sort of three continents really. Lots of our UK customers have sort of sites in the US and various places. So you know, in terms of just the way we operate in our span as a company, that's, that's, how, we, that's how we work. So the future of storage then, um, we would sort of throw up this fairly con controversial statement that you know, we might be seeing the end of appliance based storage, I think that's what we feel that is happening in customer environments that we engage with in terms of the buying habits and the way people are putting systems together at the moment, the, the, appliance, the appliance days might be numbered, um, so I probably ought to justify or explain what I mean when I'm talking about appliances. So really, an appliance-based storage product or storage system is something that we would define as being kind of a proprietary manufacturer-driven solution. Okay, so um, typically those 
platforms come with premium pricing, um, and they tend to be a closed platform from a technology point of view. So if you're putting one of those those systems, one of those solutions into your environment, you you know there are all sorts of considerations. Well, there will be all sorts of considerations with, with, with how you deploy that. You know, with your other technology, and you know, working with closed platforms can be a bit challenging. So um, that's how we would define the clients. So we what we're seeing is that you know people are moving away from that platform. We are going to present some ideas about what the alternatives to that are, and that, that's very much in keeping with what we do, obviously. Um, and this is, we think, where people should be looking. Um, and there's also quite a big cost sort of interested to this in terms of the way that you know, you're, you're managing your investment in storage in the future, because storage is an unfortunate thing and that it keeps growing and everybody has to have it. So, proprietary storage solutions for technology islands, evidently, as I just said, you, know, you put the system in for one side and sort of Sort of uh, performance requirement in the business, and inevitably there's a different performance requirement somewhere else that you know requires another. You know, you end up with these islands. Sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a good reason for that, but often there isn't actually because it's just sort of technology for different use cases. Um, I think in, con in conjunction with that, the network piece, which I, for anyone that saw Rupert's presentation earlier, he mentions the network a fair bit and the, the, how critical that is to to media environments. Um, it means all about the network really, and we. Find so often when we go into customer requirements, the network, the network performance, and the network layout hasn't been considered in the way that you know we would ideally want it to be. Um, so you know, again, with appliance based solutions, you, you tend to find that's not being considered, and uh, the way that those solutions interact with the, with the network also is, is tends to be sort of a bit of an afterthought. So, and then the, the upgrade paths with with appliance based technology are also challenging in the sense that you know most of the customers that that have experience in media have had. You know, or know of customers, people they know that have had uh, systems where you know upgrades and refreshes and support renewals tend to have be impacted by the fact that that particular vendor has stopped supporting one kind of disk, or you know, and you have to move from one platform to another, and there's a cost impact to that, um, which is often unnecessary and isn't actually what you want at a given time. So those are the sort of feelings about you know appliance-based solutions, and that is that is the model that we, you know. I would say our intended to break, I think we've broken it, we are actually out there doing this and um, <coughs> customers are investing in it. So, SAN, NAS, Archive, or Software Defined, so you know, we're moving towards this sort of, you know, this, this third way, if you like, of how, how, how storage is sort of defined and deployed for media customers. Customers are typically bought all three, um, I'm not sure that applies to you know, customers in this room, you, you know, you'll likely have a, a SAN for playback, editorial requiring high performance clients. We probably have some, some NAS storage at fairly large, but call it NAS storage to serve out files to, to sort of 3D or which effects clients. We've got a wild class stuff as well, you know, that might be splitting disk, it might be tape. There's all these different derivations of, um, of storage technology and, and systems that, that you'll have invested in. I think the, the barrier or the difficulty with that is that what we're seeing is that modern workflows are becoming much more integrated in terms of media applications. I'll give you an example in the visual effects space where we work quite heavily. Foundry are going to release, uh, I think it's called Geek Studio later this year, which is sort of finishing with Hero, Playback, Review, integrated into compositing sort of offline. You know, you'll be able to do that kind of work on you know, standard workstations and you might just want to connect that to you know, network attached storage rather than having to do all of that in a suite or a, you know, have um, sound based um, technology for that specific thing. So, you know, the workflow is sort of driving some consolidation at the desktop end, and we're, what we have been doing is, is Kind of reflecting that in the way that we, we work with the storage and the, the network and the infrastructure environments. The technology exists to consolidate them all. You don't have to have, you know, the idea. Again, we would argue that SAN, NAS. Uh, I hope that's my phone. No, it's not. Um, okay, um, it's uh, SAN, NAS. Uh, archive not necessary, but SAN and NAS are, are sort of becoming potentially becoming sort of obsolete terms. And that, as I just said, if you if you could do all of that, if you could deliver that performance in a single architecture, if you wanted to do that. You know, from why wouldn't you? Yeah. So, um, again, things are changing in that, in that area. So, I guess, you know, is there another way? And we would, we would argue that there is, and that Pixel is the name that we give it. So, uh, so, so, the other way is our way. That's obviously what, what I'm saying there. Um, unified scale out NAS and SAN architecture. So, you know, reinforcing that point, we're talking about, you know, those mixed, that, that mixed classification of performance um, and storage requirement in a single unified architecture. Pick store is the name that we give to the platform that we build and deploy. Um, with whom Route 6 are a partner for us in, in the broadcast space and um, media space. So, what I'm going to do is run through how that works and why it's good and you know, 
why it would uh, increase your performance and, and save you some money potentially. So this is just a simple, uh, a simple graphic explaining, reinforcing my earlier point. So we don't really, we care about storage only, only in as much as how we can mix it, deploy it, get speeds out of it to deliver data performance to our customers. Um, we do that in conjunction with the file system and the network. We treat all those things as one. Um, from a support point of view, I'll come back to this, but from a support point of view, we support that, that entire spectrum of, um, of workflow area. So, so, so Pixel effectively is a, is a sort of a, a consolidation of those three things. So what is it and how does it work in brief? Um, I think this will be a sort of a top level overview if anybody wants to, to get into the nitty gritty of exactly how we generate a sustainable, uh, sustainable, predictable performance barrier can probably run through that afterwards at site. But um, we can guarantee um, sustained performance to any, to any number of, of mixed clients with a single namespace. So whether they be SAN clients, which I would, that, that phrase I'd use to determine if any, uh, any streaming bandwidth, you know, um, sequential playback type client, or whether they're NAS sharing clients. Um, it doesn't matter how many of those you have in a single environment, we can support guaranteed performance rates to all of them as you wish from a single, single workspace or single namespace. We are able to do that because of the file system that we use that's at the heart of our platform and the way that that uses particular uh, elements of the hardware stack to write data to disk, it scatters uh, data in parallel across disk runs. Therefore, we eliminate file system fragmentation uh, so a system that goes in and is, delivers, let's say, for argument, say, 800 megabytes of storage availability from day one, it will still deliver that same availability, you know, two, three years later. Um, that, is, that is the way that our system works. <coughs> Likewise, it doesn't suffer from um, any slowdown or, or, or kind of um, degradation of performance at high capacity, at high capacity utilization for the same, same, for the same reason. We get incredible performance actually out of a single pixel head. So by head, I'm talking about one of our single storage node servers, which is the sort of um, the linchpin really of the, the platform. Up to 14 gigabytes a second of available storage throughput. That's 30 gigabytes. Um, it's not a mystery. You have to have quite a lot of disk spindles to generate that much I/O, but um, you know, theoretically, well, well technically, it, it can be done. Um, I don't have a customer that needs to consume 14 gigabytes a second of available storage. Performance, I think probably most of them are around two, three, four, five. You know, but you know, it, it, it is where we can go. Data management and workflow. You know, with our feature-rich file system, you know, many of you in the room might know a little bit about us and what we use. I will talk about the file system in particular in a second. But um, we, uh, we all, the, all of the usual suspects are there in terms of the feature set. You know, all of the things you'd expect to find in a, a feature-rich tier one storage solution will be present. You know, the ability to sort of manage data. Um, snapshot, all of that stuff. Um, but in particular, multiple storage pools within a single namespace. So we can have um, a high number of different storage pools in a single workspace. And that really is how we dis uh, distribute performance to different levels of clients. So if you have a bunch of SAN clients that need 2K or 4K, or you have um, a group of you know, VFX users that just need an aggregate pool of performance, they'll actually be looking at two different sets of disk lines, probably composed of different disks of different speeds. But as a, as a user, you're unaware of that. So as a sort of a management feature, they'll just see a single a single mount point, a single <coughs> So it's a completely integrated uh, working experience in that sense. Um, and as such, it pro uh, promotes collaborative working because we were, you know, we were removing those technology islands, which was you know, my former point, really. Um, interestingly, again, it's making that distinction between us and a, a typical storage company, we, we integrate with the existing pipeline and workflow, so we'll, you know, not only will we deliver that sustained performance, um, and we will also do your active directory for you and, and integrate with your, your desktop environment and support from end to end, which again is a fairly unique position to take as a, as a storage provider, if you like. Um, and you can manipulate the, um, the capacity and the config of your solution on the, you know, on the fly. So if you, if you need to grow your storage pool, you can add some more disk, you don't have to, there's no downtime involved from that. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a totally flexible sort of solution. And again, reinforcing this network thing, which you know I, I bang on about, but um, we 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 have a, a specific network engineering um, expertise in our team, and we actually support customers' networks. When we deploy systems in the first instance, we usually um, we usually agree on the system design, given what the customer wants from a from a use case scenario, and then we do an audit and go in and obviously then on a full sorts of network horrors, and that kind of um, schematic has to change in time. But it's, uh, that that is what we do. We we kind of we. we the whole workspace is our, is our support preserve, if you like, for the 
preserved. The commercial benefits of working this way and then kind of moving away from appliance based platforms and, and not investing in those kind of tier one systems are, you know, are, are probably self explanatory. But you know, we are removing vendor lock in for, uh, from customers. So, what I'm saying here is you're going to get the same performance from uh, Pixel as you would expect to get from another tier one um, NAS or SAN system, but you're not going to be locked in to that man manufacturing partner's release schedule or support schedule or you know, any of those problems that you might you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, so, we have an agnostic view towards hardware. What we really care about is that it delivers the performance that we're after for particular use cases. Um, and as such, you know, it reduces your support costs and there's an investment protection there. So, you know, I'll, I'll show you a diagram in a minute of what our system actually looks like. But if you, if we're talking about sort of storage no service or gateway service that we use, if you decide, you know, a couple of years into that system being in place that you want to refresh those servers and buy something new, then you just do that. You know, we're at our, our, our software and, you know, deployment just, just lays across the hardware refresh. There's no, you know, there's no, there's no limitation to you in that way. That's, that's we don't have a capacity-based license model. Most um, storage products or solutions that you can buy do. So, you know, if you grow your pool, you know, to you know several petabytes, you're going to you know end up going to be quite expensive. We can, I think, under a, a typical a typical uh, platform for us is probably two storage modes. Underneath that, we could grow up to think, two and a half petabytes in terms of what the storage was, uh, what the hardware was support. Eight, 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 eight and a half. Eight. That's quite different to two and a half, isn't it? <laughs> um, even if it was two and a half, it would still be good. <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> eight and a half is better, obviously. Um, I don't think we've got a customer that has eight and a half uh, better ways of storage, but um, you know, you get the point anyway. So um, all the features are included with the base license. That's important because Barry's going to talk about the global collaboration piece in a minute too. Um, and there's some very cool stuff there in terms of how we can sort of provide this performance I'm talking about, you know, across multi-site deployments, which many customers have. And there is a little bit of hardware investment required to achieve that, but um, you're, you're not looking at sort of you know additional bolt-on value at costs, and you know, but again, that's very much the sort of tier one proprietary model. It's not something you can do. So um, yeah, so you know, hardware upgrades don't have, a, um, have an impact. Your support costs, therefore, are actually about support, you know, and, and not feature releases and, and hardware refreshes. So you know, if you're, whatever our support fees are for a year, for instance, that is you know technical and workflow and data management support. That's what that's. A nice feature about 4K, 8K. So, I mean, we, I'm not sure that has been mentioned elsewhere today, but 4K, 8K workflows, there is always, you know, a, a scary workflow around the corner in terms of data sets, data sizes, resolutions, and everybody has to sort of figure out how they're going to deal with that first job that, that comes that way or in that form. The, the genes for, you know, 4K, 8K workflow are embedded in our technology, they're already there. It's only a question of, um, Introducing some some of the connectivity in the probably in the network layer actually, which, which is what Richard will explain in a minute or two. So to get that, you know, like obviously if you ever want to generate a, um, a continuous video stream of that resolution, you need enough spindles to do it. That's just a given. But um, in terms of you know the, the general config and footprint being in place, it's already there with our system. So you just um, you just roll it out, which is a nice feature. So we're talking about um, commodity pieces that we use on our platform and um, obviously we use the word commodity because we just don't want to use the word cheap because you know that's <laughs> doesn't sound as nice. <laughs> but it does. But um yeah to see. Yeah Rupert says to me you say commodity that's really your code for cheap you should just say that. So um, so I think the one thing in here that actually isn't commodity is GPFS so I've I've kind of um, you know sort of banged on about the file system a little bit. It is GPFS that allows us to deliver the sorts of uh, performance um, uh, capabilities that we have and, and, and all of the features set and data management and, and, and really allows us to drive media performance at, at a high rate through, through the environment. So GPFS actually is, is not commodity and, and isn't actually particularly cheap but then it's, it's, an, it's a manageable cost um, that Bill is the fabric. So the other areas here are, um, uh, are kind of again relatively self-explanatory. We're talking about you know best of breed commodity servers, you know usually sort of um, standard dual socket Intel server platform. We work with various hardware vendors actually. We work with Dell quite a lot of the time because their kids are very good and their pricing is also very good. Shared block storage, so the companies that um, 
as I say, there are a few other vendors we work with. It, it's a, in terms of the hardware, it's about what sort of, um, there are a few parameters that we need to meet around the, the storage controllers and a couple of other bits. But um, we can work with Dell, we can work with IBM, we can work with Kentat, there are, are various manufacturers we can work with. We work with Mellanox for the cluster in, interconnects of the network piece. And we work with them, not because they're commodity, but because they actually can deliver performance that we can't get anywhere else. That's why we use them. Um, but um, they're also very reasonably nice. Um, Zabbix is our open source monitoring uh, GUI, if you like. So we have a complete, you know, that's the complete looking glass into the, into the system so you can manage your network layer, your storage layer. And our support guys will, will help customers deploy that and, and sort of teach them how to do it. Um, so that, in, in sort of uh, in overview, is, is what PicStory is and how it works uh, and the things that we use and the performance that we, we can get. What we always find useful in meetings and stuff is that we, pictures are useful. So we generally talk about a system diagram. So I think this is a very uh, it's a slightly crude diagram. So I apologise for that, but it should uh, illustrate the point. So. Everything starts with a single storage node server on which would sit our file system, which gives you the benefits I've just described. You know, reinforcing the point there, it's a single mount point, it's a single namespace. So that is what your artists or your users in your environment will see. You know, they're not all maps to different you know, um, drive uh, drive volumes all over the place. It's a single single share. If you if you don't want it to be that, it doesn't have to be. But you know, that's that's generally the way we we're working. Single storage node with some storage underneath. So this is um, you know a simple pool of mass storage. So you know, I'm defining that as NAS because it's an aggregate workflow. So whatever size that pool is, you know, if it's 800 megabytes a second of available storage I/O, you know, that's going to get divided up by however many people are attached to it, really running to it at any one time. Going through a single server, um, multiple gigabit connections into your house network switch, which could be a variety of pieces. It's just an HP switch picture here, but that's purely because you know we can see that. There's one, obviously, uh, there's one limitation around that piece there, is that um, it's a single server. So if it's a single server, it's a single point of failure. So if that server goes down, you can't access that pool of storage anymore. I'd like to say, to say that we don't have a customer whose system looks like that, but that isn't true. <laughs> we actually do, because you know, many customers, like, like you're doing the platform, want to get into it on a sort of a low level. And because we have this building block approach, which I'm intentionally now with other building blocks in this diagram, um, you know, you can start that way. I mean, single server, a little bit dicey, we wouldn't recommend it, but sometimes from a cost point of view, because we license per server, it's what customers choose. Um, talking about the, the various pools of storage, you know, this is just an illustration of the fact that you, you're able to incorporate mixtures of client requirements here. So here we've got a NAS pool, aggregate load, and then we've got some real-time clients, a couple of uh, same view, uh, fiber over Ethernet clients running the file system and desktop clients, so they are effectively part of the storage cluster, speaking directly to the storage. There's a very clever way that they're able to do that without having to go through the um, server kernel, which Richard will explain in a minute. It's also a network piece. Um, but they'll get line rate, 10 gig, and you know, we'll be able to drive, depends on the size of that build time pool, but you know, 2K, even 4K, so whatever requirement is needed. <coughs> Obviously, you're then looking at you know a fully integrated, resilient environment. You've got two servers, you know, multiple 10 gig clients, multiple 1 gig clients. The 56 gig um, bridge there is the beginning of our the next layer of our system, which is you know the um, the 56 gig Infinity RAM slash Ethernet Ethernet enabled fabric, which which is the Mellanox uh, technology. We are in terms of the number of available SAN clients in a, in a system of that size. You've got I'm showing four here, but your limitations there across two servers are just the number of PCIe slots you would have um, or have available. You can see some of the SAS clients and the bridge between the two servers. So, if you, you know, generally we're looking at a system like that, and then if you want to scale out to multiple SAM, for want of a better term, I'm, I'm telling you that SAM measures over and using those terms, but <laughs> SAM clients, um, you'd have to go to web storage pool, you'd have to go to a, a, a fully a full sound fabric, which is which is the Mellanox switch um, supporting any number of clients um, through that fabric, you know, at, um, using the using the, the Mellanox technology. So that really is you know a simple in encapsulation of, of how our system works and how we can deliver you know high end NAS performance, um, high end real time performance in the same environment. You don't need two, three different systems to do this. And you can integrate Nearline or spinning disk archive into that same 
into that same workspace. Okay, so that you know, in, in, in lots of customers that we encounter, there's three, four different systems supporting all that stuff. You know, um, that have cost enormous sums of money over time. What, the argument that we're presenting is that if you have the expertise and you understand how to deploy a rich file system um, and best of breed hardware technology and connectivity, particularly in the network layer, you don't need to do that. Um, you can do this, and, and it's actually it's better, it's faster, and it's cheaper. So that's that's really the crux of um, our slightly controversial argument. Um, so that's enough from me. And a slight deviation here, actually. I'm just going to introduce um, Derek Barrelow, who's going to talk very briefly about Strawberry, because in terms of customers that have avid estates and editorial environments, um, we work with Strawberry, and they're here. And he's just going to run through a couple of slides on Strawberry. When he's done that, Barry's just going to talk to you about some of the technical pieces for, for global preparation. Okay. Um, we sell, I sell a product called Strawberry, which uh, has a funny name, but actually does some pretty cool stuff. Um, and luckily, everyone remembers that name. I, I used to work for Quantum and trying to get people to remember what, what uh, a scale of tape library was or what a store next file system was. It was really difficult to tell people why to sell Strawberry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically, just speaking to what Jason was talking about a moment ago, that, that whole infrastructure that he shows, that very scalable, very high performance work. Um, uh, infrastructure. Um, what Strawberry does is kind of adds a layer on top of that to help editors e edit collaboratively. Um, we, we like to say just edit, so that they don't end up spending a lot of time surfing uh, mount points and, and, and folder structures. Um, basically, <coughs> Strawberry helps them to organize their storage in a way that uh, that they don't have to worry about that anymore. So uh, here you see we call this a, a simple toolkit. To accelerate those workflows, um, and we are application independent. So, um, you know, Jason mentioned Avid, but um, I'll show you in a slide in a minute with uh, Premiere, uh, Final Cut, After Effects, Pro Tools, DaVinci. Um, Strawberry is really an independent uh, project management interface for any of those uh, editing applications. Um, and like I said, it's that single project creation point. So everyone on any of those applications can go to Strawberry. Uh, create the projects there, search their project storage, search the pics at storage um, uh, with proxy viewing with a little bit of intelligent uh, data handling. Um, the benefits of that are that, you know, like I said, the editors save time uh, that, they, that they tend to waste. Where'd you put that? What folder was that? What mount point was that? Did you give that to me? Where is that? Um, so sometimes they have to end up recreating or re-ingesting or uh, refinding equipment. Um, admins, kind of the technical side, they gain a little bit more control of the infrastructure because they're not stuck buying a proprietary solution for every individual application. Um, and you know, the management uh, tends to appreciate this because they're, because they're not buying a proprietary solution, they tend to reduce the cost. Um, so uh, this is actually a shot of Premiere. Um, and I know most, most of us are, are using Admin. We're, we're talking about Admin, but I like showing this just a kind of example of what Strawberry can do to help, help editors. Um, that's, that is our panel within Premiere. Um, when you use Strawberry to create uh, your projects, that, all that project information, all the metadata, everything can be immediately imported into the editing application. That, that's added or Premiere. Um, now, with, with, with this model, the Premiere panel, you can actually simply drag, search Strawberry via the panel, drag and drop into the, uh, the project area, it's immediately start editing. Okay? Um, and now it's a little bit more complicated because Media Composer doesn't want you to, to put a panel inside of it. But uh, because Avid scans uh, the storage quite often, uh, you can use Strawberry in a similar way, just all tab over from Strawberry back into Media Composer, and you'll immediately see uh, the footage that you've added to your, to your project. You can be able to start editing. Like I said, we're trying to make the editor's life easier. Um, like I said, we're a collaboration hub as well for not just Media Composer or Premiere, but also for Final Cut, for DaVinci, for Pro Tools, uh, Cinema 4D, After Effects. Um, because we run that front end as well, when we're talking, like, like uh, Jason was talking about before, about archival and mass, uh, or archival and production storage, um, Strawberry can actually manage both tiers for you. So um, what that means is you have a searchable repository for both the production and the archive storage. And then if an editor needs uh, a project back from the archive, he can search, he 
disappear from this rubber of GUI, see it add or re restore from the archive, we'll do a little pop up that says, hey, it's coming back from the archive. We'll get a cup of coffee, don't call your admin, uh, it's not broken. Cool. You can imagine some of you guys have probably experienced that. Um, uh, all, the the Strawberry Front is also a simple HTML5 website, which means that you can actually view it um, remotely as well for approval workflows or for maintaining and you know, kind of keeping an eye on what's going on in the background. Um, and you know, there's a simple integration capability with applications like Content Pool or um, if, if customers have a corporate man that they're using, we can either do a simple kind of push-pull integration or a more complex API integration. Um, but uh, kind of the, value, the values of that is that because we do this archive piece, we can improve the, uh, the storage utilization um, and also the admins can easily create uh, kind of um, homemade or, or custom made uh, managed team, team access for freelancers and managing different teams. Um, like I said, with the, the HTML5 front end, I talked about management can get, get, get their hands on uh, the approval process. Um, all of this stuff I'm trying to whip through in, in a couple quick slides, but it's much easier to see in a demo. So after the presentation, if you guys want to come see, we're actually showing it out front. Um, unfortunately, running on a Mac Mini, so the processing power isn't that isn't that high. But uh, but we can uh, show you the basics of how it works. So thanks for not not a good word very. too much with feeds and speeds here, but just to help to sort of reinforce uh, some of Jason's earlier points on single storage and now doing 14 gigabytes a second. We, we haven't actually found a customer yet who has a need for 14 gigabytes a second. Sorry, sorry. No, but the, the, the point is there is that uh, the, the investment protection uh, If you start off with something very small, you use that same hardware to, to grow into it. We have two different types of uh, uh, node servers that we uh, deploy and sell. One's called storage node, which is what connects to disk and drives data traffic out from disk to something else. Now, in most situations, that something else is going to be native file system clients, could be NFS, SIFs, uh, HTTP, whatever the case may be. Uh, but sometimes uh, things were large enough, say we may uh, expand outside of four storage nodes. Um, and we use uh, gateway nodes to, to, to put in between. So on the, from a gateway node perspective, each one of those gateway nodes, and again, there's a more or less a limited number of gateway nodes that can be put into a, a paste store solution. That can deliver up to uh, 10 gigabytes a second mass uh, performance. It's just uh, all about uh, CPU overheads and things like that. So, uh, a couple of uh, examples of maximum stream rates, you know, the number, number of streams we can get out again. We have yet to find a customer that would want that many new uh, Streams on anything, but hey, it may come. It may come to that. So uh, the main, the main purpose of uh, me uh, talking today is around uh, PixCache. PixCache is we, being a, a, a UK-based company with many customers in London, we find that uh, a lot of our customers uh, are opening up satellite offices, uh, just maybe in uh, New York, maybe. Amsterdam, uh, they just uh, they have centralized office in London and start picking up uh, other other uh, offices outside to uh, help serve that particular market. But more and more, they're finding that it's it's easier for them, more cost effective for them to to grow those facilities and start overflowing work to them than it is uh, necessarily to, to to operate independently, which is which what we've seen quite a bit. Where uh, one house would be working on one project while uh, their satellite office somewhere else would be working on something completely different, and, and never the two shall meet. But more and more, we're finding that they want to work together. And the problem with that is that uh, when you're sharing assets between one side and the other, you, you may have a lot of you know, RC going on, or, uh, investing a lot into uh, some, some very expensive file transfer technology. It, it, it may not be all that necessary to do that. And, and, and this is what PixCache uh, helps us to achieve. It's, uh, PixCache is a way of taking smaller uh, PixStore setups and putting them in satellite offices so that they can cache assets from the main facility. It does more than that, and we'll go into what that does. But that's the main drive, that's the main purpose of what, what PixStore is there for. 
Now that facility that could be down the road, it could be halfway across the world, it could be you know, down the street. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's effectively just a way to see what's on that main production site, but not have to make an equal investment at the, the satellite office in order to get access to the, those assets. So I, I, I'm just going to give a, a quick working example of what something like this looks like. In, in every Pix cash uh, example, we have the concept of something called home, and we have the concept of something called cash. And now, a home uh, can be a Pix store system, it can, uh, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be any NFS-enabled storage. So it uh, could be an Olison, uh, it could be a Blue Art, it could be a NetApp. It, it, it doesn't really matter. As long as you can synchronously export out NFS to something else, Pix cash can pick that up somewhere else and, and, and do the caching business that needs to do. But what it'll start off with is that maybe we have a big file system over in, uh, it's called London, and it may have one file in it. And uh, I'm sure it has a few more than that, but uh, in this example, we have our one file. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take a cache site. Again, uh, a cache typically is just a, a much smaller uh, version of the Pix store system. It can be much bigger, it can be the same size, but typically, you know, the goal is to make a smaller investment elsewhere and cache what you need to and then get rid of it. Um, when users come along to access that file, they, they go and view the file as if it's locally attached. What it, what it basically does is the cache will go over to home and pull all of the main data over from home into the cache, so if the user's going and browsing the file system doing what they need to do, they're not go having to go back to home to do it. They're not necessarily having to go through that line to grab that. Uh, and they, they, they get a much better latency. Uh, you know, the the, the, the uh, clicking through Explorer or Finder to try to look at your data, it's, you're looking at the cache system. You're not looking at the home system. So it would be a bit, a bit more speedy. So they see all the files as if they are right there locally attached. Uh, somebody comes along to actually access a file. What will happen is that it will, the cache will go back to home, and depending on the number of pick store heads there, sometimes that will happen in parallel from, a, from an NFS transfer uh, perspective. It will take the blocks of data that are at home and transfer them over to the cache. So it moves over and it stays at the cache. And from that point, they can start to uh, work on it locally. It's not, you're not constantly transferring data back and forth. It's just there. Everyone's happily uh, motoring along at the cache site. Uh, of course, if you make a change to the file, you're probably going to want to put it back to the home. So, <coughs> any changes, uh, any changes, any deletions, any uh, additions that go into the cache side, within a few seconds, and this is tunable, so that this can be made to, you know, set it for midnight, but typically it happens uh, with five seconds after uh, any block of data has been changed to the cache side. It will automatically push that back to home. So the relationship from home to cache is always a pull. You're, you're requesting data, it comes, it stays there. Uh, the relationship from cache to home is always push. So anything that you put in the cache always has to end up back at home. That's, uh, that tends to be how it works. Now, of course, uh, if someone comes along and accesses every file that, can, that, that uh, the cache can see, which may happen to be you know, 10 terabytes worth of storage, on the cache, but there's 200 terabytes of storage at home. That's not going to work. It's eventually you're going to fill that up, and it's going to go. So uh, what will happen is that there'll be a, a quota set against the cache. It says once you reach this certain point, usually it's around 80, 90 percent utilization of, of the, uh, the overall cache. Go ahead and start looking what uh, the, the, the oldest assets that haven't been touched in X amount of time, and start expunging those blocks from the file system. The data is still seen. You can still, sorry. The metadata is still seen, so it looks like nothing happened to it, but the, the, the file has effectively gone back to home, and if the user comes to access it again two months later, the process starts all over again. So uh, we, we, we have situations where um, there is uh, only one terabyte of storage uh, at, the, at the cache site uh, serving out 200 terabytes of storage at the home. We have situations where equal between the two, and it's more of a, a workflow thing, but this gives you a nice way to job overflow, uh, expand, uh, one common case that we 
run into lies where there's no more room in the data center to put any more render nodes, so instead of putting them in London, they'll put them somewhere else and just continue to cache the data when the render's done and it, things are seen well. Like, and there's no file path problems that, that get run into with that, so it just, just kind of goes and does what it needs to do. So, um, that is the, the most common use case for this that, that we run into. There, there's, there's quite a few more. And this, again, this is what we just talked about. Uh, you have a cache system that will push data out, but it also pulls data back in. So it's, only, it's, a, it's an on-demand thing when it comes to taking assets from home and putting them on cache, but not an on-demand thing when it comes to you know, taking them from a data store and putting them back to home. It just pushes it straight through. And because of that, um, it, it gives it a, a, a very nice way of doing asynchronous uh, DR, so, uh, well, asynchronous replication, rather. So, we have other situations where the cache site, the thing that we just talked about being a smaller entity somewhere else, actually becomes the main production site. Because, because it's forced to pull, sorry, because it's forced to push any assets that are dropped into the cache, we make the production site the cache of the DR site. And that that will force you know the, you know all the traffic. No, sorry, it will force all the blocks of data to end up back at DR. And uh, should the production site go down, you can pick up at the DR site, do what you need to do. The data is all there unless you know it's happened. The outage has happened in the previous few seconds, depending on lines and so forth. Uh, but the data is there, and it, failing over is, is is one thing. But what what can be quite difficult in, mo in most situations with this sort of thing is failing back. You know, you've gone to DR, you've changed a lot of your data, what, you know, what, what do you do then? Are you going to have to go back and do R-Syncs or try some you know, keep note of times and things like that? And you, you don't necessarily have to do that in this situation. Because once the, once the cache comes back online, those blocks of data may not actually be at production, but there's a prefetching facility being built in where we can say, right, any, you know, uh, someone it may access this, so let's go ahead and pull it back. Just in the case of someone may access it, but we want the data back on the home site. So we just run the prefetch, goes back to home, picks up all the files that, that, that weren't there before, everything's in sync. Another, uh, another thing we like to do is we call it NAS acceleration. And this is, this is a, a migration ease utility when we, we're bringing in a new system, a uh, new pick store system, and uh, uh, traditionally, Having to sync from one bit of storage over to another can be quite a cumbersome process. You know, you know, it could be through a robocopy or an RC. There might even be a commercial product that you put in there to, to try and achieve that. And so, uh, oftentimes, you're finding yourself in situations where you're having to you know, sync all the data over from the old stuff to the new stuff, and then tell the users you can't use the system for the weekend while we complete the sync. You know, uh, it, for fear of having the sync not pick up those, those, those bits of data that are changed in the, in, during the final sync window. So um, one way we can sort of help alleviate that is, is reduce the, the necessity to, to sync straight away by putting the pick store system in and having it cache the older entity. So that you, we bring in a pick store, we, we, we set the system up and we make it a cache of the older NFS-based storage. And, uh, just basically change uh, the DNS entries so that users are going through pit store to get to their older storage, and uh, that that you end up having a nice natural migration process. In that instance, we, we don't tell the storage you know when you get to this certain point you, you should start expunging it. We say always keep anything that, that's been accessed. So gradually blocks will start to move over, and if we get in a big rush, we really want to pull it over. We just we just again we just prefetch it. Go ahead and pull everything that in that you can possibly see. Keep it there. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, that we're, we're big fans of that one. We go on a lot, you know, in, in general, and not just in this situation. We go on a lot about eliminating islands of technology, and, and it's not always the most realistic thing to do. You know, there's there's uh, a lot of uh, fine step, fine space applications that they may come with their own storage, and why not use it, right? It's attached directly there. Or other situations where the customer isn't really ready to make that investment into centralizing a lot of the real-time, a lot of the, the, the faster elements, and they just want some central storage. Um, 
this is a way to, to, to help centralize all of that, nevertheless, uh, with, without having to get rid of all that other stuff. Uh, one customer we have, uh, it's a good example, they have uh, a couple of base lights and uh, quite a bit of uh, locally attached storage that they use to, to do it. Sometimes they, they use this store to, to pull off real-time streams, but for the most part, they're using the base light for, for that purpose. Uh, when they were finding themselves in the situation where they were having to still having to copy data back and forth from the bit back and forth uh, from the baseline storage, back up the pick store storage, and it was all getting a bit of a mess, you know, losing track of what the data is, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So what, what we did is, uh, be because the uh, baseline supported NFS exports out from its own storage, we, we effectively just made pick store a cache of the baseline storage. So if anyone wants to get any data onto the, to, uh, onto the baseline, they just go and drop it into the pick store, which automatically pushes it over to the baseline, and vice versa, if someone wants to get something off the baseline, they're doing it from one centralized place, rather than going, yes, you copy it here, and you're going to copy it here, and stuff. So it's still copying at the end of the day, uh, but you're only doing it one wrong place, so it's much easier time of who's got the ball. Viewing stations are another great example where there be, there'd be a, a couple of SSDs attached and instead of somebody dragging over a, a USB drive or dragging and dropping through the network, they just go and, and place the content uh, into the big store system which will naturally filter back through to, to the viewer. So yeah, that, that's, that's Pixcash. Now this is something that uh, you know, is, is not an additional license. Sometimes there's some additional infrastructure needed, you know, depending on the way the, the exports go. But this is not something that we, we, we force additional licenses on. It comes with Pixar built into it, and uh, yeah, we, we, we think it's quite good. So I'm just going to finish up on a couple of things that we're working on uh, that have nothing to do with Pixar, really. But um, it's a sort of a short-term roadmap. Uh, we're, we're working very hard on a, a Python REST API. There's a lot, a lot of data management capability within the overall system. It's not always the easiest to use. So uh, we, we, we've taken a look at uh, gone a lot of our customers who they may have their own built-in project management systems, their own, uh, their own NAMs that they've uh, developed themselves, or they might be using commercial uh, applications that have the ability to plug into Python or REST APIs. And we've had a lot of requests for that. This is sort of abstracts of the command sets in the overall file system to interact with that directly, either through Python or uh, in a RESTful manner. Another driver for that that makes it a hell of a lot easier for us to deliver very feature-rich GUIs uh, from a management perspective. So it's something that we're working very, very hard on. Mobile SSD caching is, is another thing. Uh, this is something to help along. Uh, render activity mostly but this is the biggest driver for us where uh, a read-only cache uh, is, is effectively, you put an SSD into one of the storage servers something gets read in and it stays there. We do that with memory, we do that with RAM at the moment already, but RAM's expensive, there's only so much of it you can put into a storage server, so we can get a couple of terabytes of SSD and it makes the cache line a bit very nice. SMB3 support as well, if you're into this one. So that's, uh, that's it, thank you very much. Oh, I'm very sorry, very rude me. That's not it, we now have Richard from Mellanox is, is going to talk about uh, uh, Mellanox uh, and Finibans uh, and some of the technology that helps drive what we do. So. Thank you, Richard. Hi, um, I'm Richard Hasty. I look after the media and entertainment vertical for Mellanox. For EMEA, I'm conscious I've got the graveyard shift today, so I'm going to be as quick, um, as rapid as possible because I think I'm standing between you and some beers. <laughs> um, and I want one as well. So uh, before I before I break into very, you know, one or two slides about my box and what we're doing, um, one of the key things is um, everybody can appreciate that Pixstore can get to 14 gigabytes per second out of a single bed. That's actually quite difficult to do. Um, and one of the questions that keeps getting raised is, well, okay, how are you actually get into that kind of performance? Um, as you've noticed in the diagram, um, TCP itself is a very, very buffer orientated uh, protocol. You may, not, you may or may not know this, but actually in each of your workstations, 
in each of your storage platforms, wherever TCP is being used, it actually spends large portions of its time copying data from one buffer to another. That uses CPU and actually takes time and introduces latency into delays, uh, which is not good if you're trying to get to sensible performance levels. Uh, now, one of the things that Mellanox has learned from high performance computing, which is our heritage, is that actually TCP can be a little bit of a challenge when you're trying to move a bit large amounts of data around. So, uh, there's an industry standard called RDMA that stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. Uh, and essentially, it's a protocol that works over both InfiniBand, which is used in the high performance computer arena, or also Ethernet. Um, in things like post-production and other you know, media and entertainment use cases. And essentially what it does is it removes all those buffers. And what it means is you can actually get to line speed, you can actually get to uh, very, very high performance. And that's the magic source. That's essentially how Pixel can actually get that kind of 14 gigabytes per second out, down the wires into the workstations if you need those kind of performance demands. Okay. So again, very briefly, Malinox, for those people that don't know us, and actually not a lot of people do, we are an organisation that's been built up based on commodity in the high performance compute arena. So we literally build you know, the multi-thousands, thousands of nodes, um, supercomputers that go around the world, and we spend also a huge amount of time in the, the big cloud vendors. But one of the things that we essentially do is an end-to-end -end networking um, proposition. We build our own silicon, we manufacture our own adapter cards, um, we obviously manufacture our switches, the cabling, we have the MetroX product range for doing things over extended distances. We bas basically, you can come to Malabox to do a complete end-to-end -end networking solution, or the plumbing, as I tend to tend to describe it. Um, now why are we slightly different to most other vendors? Well essentially all of our equipment is designed from the ground up to do two different things. Firstly it caters for very very low bandwidth requirements like one gigabit but it has the ability to scale to very very high performance bandwidth requirements so it can go from 1 to 10 to 40 to 56 gigabit. And then on the other side of the coin is we are completely protocol agnostic. So we have a concept called VPI, where all of our chips and our silicon that we manufacture can actually support both InfiniBand, they can also support Ethernet, they can also support fiber channel over Ethernet. So actually from the one box or the one chip that they're using in the adapter card, you can do lots of different clever things. You can use it for storage, you can use it for data data communications, you can use it for interconnect for the clusters, there's lots of different ways you can take advantage of this technology. So, what I wanted to do is to show you this room. This is our baby switch. Okay? This is a very, very aggressively price point, as I mentioned, we, we work from a commodity perspective. Um, and essentially, it's a 1U half width device with what looks on it to be particularly boring 12 ports, okay? So these 12 ports are, will run up to 56 gigabit. So the, you know, the actual box itself has got plenty of ports for that. But what's really interesting about this box is that each one of these ports you can split. So each one of these ports you can split into four and you can run four one gig or four 10 gig ports literally off every single one of these. So essentially in this half U box, which has got uh, two power supplies and uses about 60 watts electricity, you can put 48 10 gigabit internet links for your workstations, gradient, gradient studios or whatever you need into that device. And if you put them next to each other, you can get two in, in one U, which gives you a density of about 96 ports, well, 96 ports, which is the best on the market that I've seen in, at the moment. So, in terms of the investment protection and the flexible facilities, this box gives you great longevity. If you need 1 gig today, you can use it with 1 gig. If you need 10 gig tomorrow, you just change the cable and change the, the adapter module. If you ultimately need a 4K requirement that takes you into the DPX realm, 
then yes, you can go beyond 10 gig, you can go to 40 gig. And if you really want to be radical, and we've got some organizations in Japan doing this now, this box is already doing 8K 10-bit DPX at around 48 gigabits per second. So it really will scale with you as an organization right into the future. It has a sister switch, um, which actually is a different form factor. It's 48 ports, but, but it also has the mirror of these. So it has 12 ports of 56 gig as well. Um, this is very dense as well, but it has different use cases and it's very good for things like topple rack, um, render node connectivity, and storage connectivity in the data center. So one other point I just want to point out is there's a lot of debate now when is the right point to do the transition for the workstations, for the artists' workstations from 1 gig to 10 gig. And with the premise that you're now going to see more real-time attend requirements associated with things like 4K coming down the line, it's really now worth thinking about how you take advantage of that when you come to refresh. Um, the price point for 10 gigabit is yes, there's still a premium associated with it, but it's not prohibited any longer. Yeah? When you've got switches like this that can actually put the port prices on the floor of around £109 per port, it actually becomes viable to have that conversation. Particularly when you know you've got the investment protection for 4K, for 8K into the future. And then just in summary, I just wanted to just give a very quick overview of why I believe Mellanox is like the Swiss army knife for media. Firstly, we can support all the workloads. We can support Ultra HD, we can support 4K, we can even support 8K if we've got that working in organizations now. We can actually show you that working on whatever application or with whatever storage you, you choose to use, like Pixit Media. We've got a very, very dense form factor. You know, in reality, this switch uses less power than a 60 watt light bulb. So in reality, it's been designed from the ground up to reduce your operating expense and to reduce your capex. It's got one chip in it. So it's not expensive for us to manufacture, and as a consequence, we can pass on that price point to you. There's no concept in Mellanox of things like pods and cots. We don't believe in performance on demand or capacity on demand. Every single device, every single car that we sell, everything is enabled day one. Every port is there, and as a consequence, you can take advantage of that. You don't have to get into that license management cycle that I know can be a real pain for many organizations. I've already mentioned the power density. Um, you've got that advantage of doing that 40% upgrade. Now, in reality, I would say almost everybody in this room is not going to need 8K today. Yeah? And I would also say everybody in this room probably won't need 8K in the next two years. But actually, a device that has that ability to just tweak that extra 40% horsepower when you need it is actually something that might be quite interesting from an investment protection story. And the last point is we don't cripple the switch from a software perspective. Every protocol, every feature is enabled from day one. And then finally, you know, we've got a strong history of executing, not only in the media and enterprise space, but also in lots of other verticals. So really, you know, we've got a solid heritage. We're a three and a half billion dollar organization. We're not, we're not small. Um, and we actually have the abilities to stand behind solution partners like Pixit, <coughs> reseller organizations and partners like Route 6, and really support you into, into the enterprise. Thank you.